is John Johnson. And while I'm a former board member, I think it's important to note that I'm not currently on the board, um, but I do serve on the legislation and regular for, regulatory affairs committee. Uh, I'm currently on the curriculum committee and I spent over a decade working with uh, conference uh, preparation. Uh, and my the biggest value I think I bring to the table in trying to manage this current issue that we're having uh, is that I'm the OSHA instructor on behalf of the association. And so um, Jeff was talking about how we released the first edition of this document and then um, yesterday we released version 1.1. The document isn't meant to be like final, but rather evolving as recommendations come in, as more information comes in. Um, we're also looking at like, while we're recommending people follow their local or state or federal laws, what if your state opens, you know? Um, so we're, we're in communication or sending information out to states like Georgia, um, letting them know that they haven't met that gating criteria and they should reconsider the opening of body art facilities so soon. Yeah, uh, just to elaborate on that, uh, the, when we found out, when the APP found out that uh, Georgia was gonna be opening prior to established uh, criteria, and that, that is, I think it's important to understand what that criteria is, is that uh, an area reaches phase two, which is a, a two-week decrease in flu-like symptoms, uh, a two-week decrease in confirmed COVID infections, uh, hospitals changing from crisis mode, and enough testing and beds to take care of all healthcare workers in the area. Uh, necessarily all but enough that if they became infected so it's a really easy sort of three-pronged uh thing to you know if we hit these three landmarks and we should be okay to open uh, according to the cdc um so since the that criteria hasn't been met in georgia we uh got in touch with georgia uh uh last night to let them know that, that we disagreed with the opening of body art facilities. Um, but uh, that's not gonna stop areas from opening. Uh, in, the, in the comments I see Beth are saying, it didn't stop any, uh, many people and uh, a lot of shops opened. Um, yeah, and if, if you're looking for support for something like that, you know, get a hold of us. If you have recommendations um, or suggestions for the guidelines, um, get a hold of us. We think that it's important for this to be a dialogue among people in this industry um, to figure out how we move forward um, when it's our time to move forward in our different areas. I'd like to add to that just a uh, little bit. Um, while there are different agencies, um, different industries that are trying to manage their portion of the, the pandemic, uh, you know, the APP is doing its part by trying to, to create suggested protocols for reopening our studios. It's inevitable that studios that survive the economic crisis of this, it's inevitable that studios open. And at a minimum, it needs to be when it's allowed by law, but decision making on a studio by studio basis where it is allowed, I think really needs to happen within the studio itself. Like studios now have to develop stricter protocols for managing the risks in their studio for both their staff and their clients. And while uh, I'm gonna reiterate what, what Monica said about it being a dialogue, that dialogue also has to take place within the studio. because so I think it's unfair to reopen if not everybody in the studio agrees to new procedures and protocols that benefits everyone. We all need to be comfortable going back to work. It's not enough to be green-lighted by the state to go to work. Everybody has to be on board with not only when they choose to open, but how they choose to open. And that's an internal dialogue between the studio members, staff members. 
And I think in the document we release, we try to stress the importance of not only, um, you know, preparing the studio and making a decision about your individual situation, but to include everybody on staff in that conversation when you're making protocols, because this will affect everything from front of house to back of house um, and everything in between. So it, it's important to get all staff members involved in this, in this conversation uh, and training. So do we want to go ahead and look into the three different, uh, the three pronged approach that we're taking uh, with these, these guidelines? That sounds great. So the, the basis for the guidelines right now is CDP, clean, distance, and protect. Uh, clean means enhanced cleaning uh, throughout the facility, coming up with protocols for how to do this more regularly. Uh, continued social distancing where applicable. Uh, so this is everywhere in the studio up into the point of the procedure. And then P is expanded use of personal protective equipment. Um, training and protocols should be in place for each one of these things before moving forward or before opening happens. Jeff, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, enhanced cleaning in the studio? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things that when we were writing these, uh, we wanted to decide uh, a lot of a lot of our facilities are pretty really well disinfected. I expect uh, uh, better disinfected than most facilities. Period. Uh, even most like doctors' offices and things like that. But we wanted to figure out what are the, the areas where we can have issues um, and uh, does the front counter staff usually have access um, to things like uh, hand hygiene and that sort of thing. So uh, we decided that obviously like disinfecting uh, regularly used uh, surfaces, uh, especially countertops, pens, but uh, if you're doing digital uh, release forms, things like tablets, the seating areas, the bathrooms. Uh, it's not enough to do those a uh, couple times a day. It pro probably needs to be done hourly um, or in between clients. Um, uh, so having protocols for that, that the entire team um, understands, is trained on, and also uh, has the ability to do. Uh, one of the important parts of that is that when you get the green light to reopen and you make that decision, you're going to have staff members and you, they don't necessarily have the experience that a peer sure does in terms of donning and doffing uh, gloves and how to perform hand hygiene. So all that has to be retrained um, and reinforced. And uh, as with all sorts of uh, training like that, it's a really good idea to document it. So be, be prepared for that part of things. You won't be able to just open the doors and say, wipe things down. It's going to be more complicated than that and more involved than that. Uh, we really like the idea of having everyone have a lot more access to hand hygiene. Uh, it's sort of become kind of the joke of uh, the pandemic that you just got to wash your hands, but uh, knowing how to wash your hands and having that uh, reinforced is pretty important. Um, uh, ventilation, which is usually a thing that I think a lot of us don't think too much about, uh, is uh, pretty important and that probably means changing your air filters, increasing the circulation, uh, when possible, uh, open windows and things like that, but we have restrictions in terms of we need to maintain the air quality of our piercing procedure rooms. So a lot of thought and consideration has to be put into how to do that. And while I'd love to say I know exactly how to do it for your facility, it's going to be one of those things that's a facility by facility decision and you need to think pretty uh, thoroughly about it. Um, HEPA air filtration, really good idea. And areas that you didn't necessarily have HEPA filters, uh, such as the waiting room and the bathroom, probably a really good idea. Um, uh, and of course, as we decide that these things are good ideas, they're going to be harder and harder to uh, get into your shops because uh, there's going to be 
um, a lot of people trying to buy them all at once. So be, be prepared for all those things. Um, I'll touch on some of that just a little bit, um, if you don't mind, Jeff, Monica. I don't mind at all, please. Um, uh, hearing you speak uh, uh, brought two things to my attention. I'll start with the, the one of the last things you said about um, the scarcity of supplies increasing as it gets, um, as, as we wait. And so I'd like to kind of remind everybody, chance favors the prepared mind, uh, famous old uh, expression. And so I think the it's inevitable that our studios are going to open for studios and shops that can withstand the economic aspect of this uh and and i believe most of us probably will it's inevitable that we open and so every day that goes by we get one closer to saying yes we have to finally open our doors and so it's prudent to prepare for that as soon as possible and for anyone who may not have all the supplies in the studio now that they need, um, they should uh, they should get on that as soon as possible. In our studio, um, we've already replaced the gloves and the disinfectants that we've donated. Um, we've purchased three new HEPA filters, uh, for example. And and here in California, you know, we're we're at a stay at home order until at least May fifteenth, without knowing if that's going to get pushed back or not. Um, but we're already replacing some of those uh, supplies, and I would encourage everyone else to, to kind of think uh, similarly to that. Um, and the other thing, going back to uh, the need to train the staff on new protocols, I'd like to point out that um, from an OSHA perspective, which affects those of us in the United States, uh, and exclusively the, uh, in the U.S., since that's OSHA's jurisdiction, um, what we're doing now affects our exposure control plans and studios are with exposure to blood like us are required to have an ECP and when you make changes to procedures in the studio relevant to worker safety you have to update your exposure control plan and did I bore you up to death already uh, and when you uh, when you change your exposure control plan it's required in the U.S. that you retrain your staff. So be prepared for that. I wasn't bored, John. I was checking on my son. <laughs> to add I to that, that on, I have that effect on people. <laughs> uh, to add to some of that stuff, uh, part of our suggestions is to assess the the body art facility's budget and ordering processes because there is going to be differences in pricing and availability of these supplies. Um, and then it's making sure that you're using the supplies properly. Uh, you may have a bunch of different products that are the same products you're used to using, or maybe now you are exploring different products because of availability. Um, so it's making sure we're following the manufacturer recommendations for each product that we're using in the studio. Um, do you have anything to add on to the cleaning section or do we wanna move on to distancing? I think we should move on to distancing. Okay, perfect. So. Uh, implementing continued social distancing in the studio will look like, uh, it'll look different for every studio. Um, we're talking about basically up into the point of the procedure where we are uh, keeping, you know, a six foot radius uh, between each people or person, but also seeing if we can eliminate some unnecessary face-to-face -face interactions with clients uh, coming into the studio in the first place. So we're talking about screening clients, uh, doing emails, uh, video conferencing for troubleshooting. Um, when you're setting appointments, if you're going to go appointment only to reduce the number of people in the studio, um, you know, maybe having them do paperwork through email, having aftercare information available digitally so you don't have to go over it in person um, to avoid exposure. So video aftercare, written aftercare on your website or in the email. Um, we can also encourage clients to use like touchless forms of payment uh, whenever possible, uh, but that goes back into cleaning. If we are gonna handle cash, then we need to be following hand hygiene in between each interaction. Uh, Jeff, do you have stuff to add on to that distancing in the studio? Yeah, in terms of uh, distancing, 
we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, the practitioner is not going to be distant when they're performing a piercing or doing a jewelry change. Like, yeah. and that is one of the things where it's important to understand that there is some risk uh, that's greater than normal in performing our job, right? When uh, a grocery store clerk uh, is working right now and they've installed uh, barriers and things and they're trying to perform distancing, well, that means that the grocery store clerk's job is more dangerous than it was originally, but they're not in anyone's face right? Whereas we will be. Um, and uh, that speaks to um, uh, why our, our timeline for returning back to work is extended significantly past uh, something like even a movie theater or a thing, something like that. It's because we're going to have face-to-face -face contact. It's unavoidable to what we do. Um, and uh, it, it's it's frustrating for all of us, but we can't eliminate that aspect of it. So be prepared for that. Um, another thing we talk about with distancing is, is being flexible with your protocols for, you know, employees showing up to work while being asymptomatic is, uh, is still a factor in spreading COVID. Um, we can at least be aware of those that are symptomatic. I think our, pro uh, our protocols need to be the same across the board, kind of like, you know, our day to day is already you know, practicing hygiene and being safe, um, but now it's enhancing those things. So if we can, if we can screen people and keep them from coming into the studio, like employees or clients, um, if they have symptoms, that is something we can do to reduce the spread if possible. So one of the things that we suggest is things like checking temperatures. Um, if you're doing something like that in the studio, if you're allowed by law, if the people consent to it, is using no contact infrared thermometers. Um, an alternative to that, and John has one right there. Uh, what I've been reading is there's a little bit of a learning curve in getting a reliable reading on these things. So again, that's gonna be another point of training. Um, another alternative is, you know, having clients check their temperatures at home and report them to the studio as part of the appointment process or the release form. Um, and again, like marking throughout the studio where people can stand, maybe suggesting that they wait out in their car until it's time for their procedure so that we can limit the number of people in the studio. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, John? I'd like to say a little something. Okay. Um, part of uh, part of distancing ourselves uh, can include um, limiting the studio hours to essential hours. Right. You know, a a, a ten hour day or an eight hour day is um, is a potentially more exposure than a a uh, four or five or six hour day, especially if you're working by appointment only. Um, and then limiting to uh, essential workers. Like if you've got, if you've got a staff that's able to operate under limited conditions like appointment only, um, I think it would be uh, a good idea to maybe not bring more people physically into your studio to work than is necessary to handle the workload. Another thing that I uh, forgot to mention about the front of house, um, a lot of our furniture in the studio, if you look at like our piercing rooms and stuff, they are uh, wipeable or non-porous, but then we have furniture out in the lobby area. So consider, you know, replacing, removing uh, furniture that can't be cleaned effectively or using things like plastic covers. So we're really gonna have to evaluate everything um, where we have the public entering, where there is less control of what can get touched and what needs to get cleaned, um, and seeing where you can limit uh, limit risk. Some people will even be closing their waiting rooms entirely. Uh, yeah. There will be no place to sit. Uh, we're going to eliminate that. 
I think that the emphasis is on uh, individual situations. This can look different to everybody, and, and these guidelines or recommendations should just kind of serve a, as a thought provocation, you know, like, okay, I didn't think about this, maybe I need to do this, and then it, it, it brings other ideas about it, how you can further distance or uh, limit some risks. Uh, moving on to the protection part of the CDP, uh, we have, you know, so PPE is already a part of an every procedure practice in body art. Um, now, due to the airborne nature of coronavirus, more and extensive PPE practices are recommended during this pandemic. Um, do you want to talk about that, Jeff? Sure. My son's going wild in the background. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, when we discussing the PPE uh, uh, changes, um, in the past, the kind of personal protective equipment that we expected to be used in a piercing studio uh, were exam gloves. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of sterile gloves, and the APP recommends sterile gloves for procedures. Uh, but things like face masks, goggles, face shields, uh, those were, you know, you're doing it great, but it's not required. And going forward, we can obviously see that there's, uh, for especially an airborne thing like this, uh, for both protection of the piercer and protection of the client, uh, wearing uh, personal protective equipment uh, of the face is pretty critical. Uh, there are a few issues with that. Uh, the first issue is uh, availability. Uh, it may be very challenging to get your hands on things like face masks, goggles, uh, uh, face shields, getting the appropriate ones for a medical setting. Uh, I forget what the ASTM number uh, is. Maybe Brian can post it in the, um, uh, in the comments, but there's an ASTM standard for uh, face masks uh, that we'd like to see them at. Them at. Thank you. Uh, it's 2100, um, F2100. Uh, so getting those th sorts of things is going to be very challenging. Uh, and in addition, uh, there is a little bit of an ethical dilemma there. And I think it'd be uh, remiss not to mention that. When we're consuming uh, essential personal protective equipment, that means that we're and further taxing the supply chain. And uh, that's an issue. Uh, and, so when when we reconsider opening, we've got to also reconsider that. Fortunately, in a lot of states, you can actually look at how many face masks your hospital has and how many uh, face shields and how many surgical gowns and how many gloves they actually have that data available to you. Uh, and you can see how long they expect that supply to last. So if you're ser seeing zero to six days um, in your local hospital, I would argue that you have you, your hospital does not meet the standard for not being in crisis care, and therefore it hasn't met the standard for reopening. However, it's going to be a challenge if uh, everybody in your area is open and you're not. Uh, so, uh, uh, something that I want to discuss, and I I don't really know where to fit this part in, but um, I, I'm going to have as little judgment for my colleagues during this uh, as possible. Uh, I know there's gonna be times where someone does something and I think they're making a, a, a bad mistake. Um, but for those people, I'm going to make a phone call if I think it's egregious enough. And I think uh, uh, those sorts of things, being very uh, forgiving in your heart is gonna be um, uh, better, better for the whole community um, and uh, people are going to learn better uh, if we approach things that way than if we're calling people out on the internet. I don't think there's any reason to do that. And I don't think there's any positive uh, uh, change that's going to occur from that. Uh, call in, not call out when it comes to these sorts of things. So let me chime in on, uh, on, on this topic of protecting just a, uh, a tad bit. Um, uh, ethics and hospital supply chains and things aside, Again, it's inevitable that our studios are going to open and under the heading of protecting, uh, barriers and PPE are crucial to that process. 
And yes, products are going to be in limited supply. And yes, they're going to be more expensive, which even further limits uh, our accessibility to them. Uh, knowing that we're going to open one by one uh, across the, the US and of course across the world, our, our studios are going to open again. When the supply chains are cut again for these particular products like PPE, uh, it's okay to close again when you don't have what you need to operate to the new standard. Right, like we're all closed now. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of experts around the globe are predicting second waves. I, I saw on the news this morning that Singapore is struggling with the second wave of, of COVID-19 and, and in terms of how we manage that in our studios, if we've closed now for four, five, six, seven, eight weeks, and then we get to reopen and then we run out of masks and face shields and disinfectant wipes and all these things, it's okay to close again until they're available. I think moving into it, it's really going to be about flexibility and individual situation um, because so many experts are saying there are going to be instances where things are reopened and then closed and then reopened and then closed um, in reaction to, you know, how things are in that state or locally as far as cases. Um, so if you don't have you know, the proper protective equipment, then you have to evaluate each day, each week do we do business? Are we able to do business? Um, in this section on protection, we also talk about, you know, having visual media around the studio to help people with, uh, you know, proper hand hygiene, also with how to don masks, um, suggesting that clients come to their appointments with their own mask, uh, which always brings about, it brings about a, an interesting question of, do we then have people remove their mask to perform a piercing on them? Um, and I think that's up to each studio uh, to decide what, what might be best for them. Right now, um, I would say use discretion and maybe if it's not essential to perform a procedure in the nose or the mouth, to maybe avoid it until we have more relevant information. Yeah, and that's a type of, of conversation that needs to happen within the studio yeah I, assessing any procedure what uh what kind of risks does this procedure bring and 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 from our general understanding and the data available and making policies but also understanding that these policies need to be reviewed regularly and then uh becky or brian do we have some questions do we want to start answering some questions jeff john yeah, questions. Um, keep in mind, guys, that um, we have uh, limited to no access at any time over the chat window. And so uh, questions uh, specifically that you might think we can help with uh, should be placed in the Q&A window. Hey, sorry to interrupt, guys. Um, Monica, do you mind starting with the questions that have been emailed in first before oh, we yeah. do Q&A? Thank yeah, you. of course. Thank you for bringing that up. So prior to this panel um, starting today, when we were advertising it, we did ask people to send us any questions they may have based off of our recommendations or in anticipation of this. Um, so one of the somebody that sent us uh, some questions, they want to know what are your thoughts on limiting piercings for minors during initial reopening? such as no one under the age of 13, 16, 18 during this time. Um, as far as my thoughts on this, I mean, each studio is going to have a different policy already regarding minors. Um, so at the studio that I work at, we don't pierce under the age of 16. Um, but I think it's up to that studio to assess if there's going to be a, a need for them to to kind of uh, put age limits on this? Do we, we're already limiting the number of the people in the studio. Uh, Jeff or John, do you have thoughts on this question? Yeah, uh, so one of the things, it, it's the same issue that I have with limiting certain piercings, uh, uh, of like the nose and the, and the mouth, is that um, we probably have that one person that's been emailing us waiting to get in for a jewelry change or, hey, this piercing's not healing well, and we do the digital um, 
uh, troubleshooting and they just they really want to get in because thing things aren't going the way they're supposed to uh i i can't see turning down a younger person just because they're younger um i don't think I, uh that that's the same choice that everyone else is going to make but i don't think it's going to affect the way i, I reopen um uh, yes, it's an extra person because the parents got to be present. Uh, and I understand like that's uh, knocking down the distancing a little bit. Uh, but I'm also assuming that they're living together and seeing one of them is the same as seeing both of them. So it's the, the issue that I've been uh, racking, uh, discussing uh, with my wife uh, who owns the shop with me. Um, I don't think there's a... Uh, black and white answer it's just, it's not it's not obvious to me and if there does end up being information it's like oh you really don't want to see kids for a reason x y or z i'm like okay cool let's not do it yeah sure i mean uh my my feeling on it is that when a a parent and their child walk into the studio for some type of service knowing that it's an elective service they have um, res assumed responsibility for the risks that they're taking. Likewise, um, I think that the studio itself and then uh, uh, to narrow it down on a practitioner by practitioner basis get to decide what responsibilities they're willing to assume. Right? We have studios that may not offer certain piercings. It wouldn't be uh, uncommon or unlikely to find a piercing studio that doesn't do surface piercings or or uh, uh, in a studio certain piercers may not do certain piercings this would be in tune with something that we already practice yeah so making decisions practitioner practitioner um, studio by studio uh, the only thing I can think of is maybe very small children and stuff if they're guests but I think that goes into our distancing is is you know eliminating additional guests in the studio. Um, the next question was, do you believe there are any piercings with an absolute no-go during reopening, such as those in the nose and mouth area where um, exposure may be greatest? So we touched on that a little bit, but I do, like, like John and uh, Jeff were saying regarding you know, age limits, I think it's going to be up to each studio to make that decision. Yeah, I just, I, I wish I could say for sure that if someone came in with a, uh, a, a lip piercing that needed to be changed, that it'd be like, no, nope, uh, not, not doing anything in the mouth right now, just you're going to have to keep on dealing with it. And the answer is, I'll probably help that person if they need it. Um, so uh, yes, uh, that's more risk for me. Um, and uh, I would totally respect it if shop said, no, nope, that's, that's not a thing that I'm willing to do. Um, uh, it really is sort of a, a, a shop by shop basis. And I would fully respect if a shop said, no, we're not doing any, any uh, piercings with the mouth or the nose, no jewelry changes to the mouth and the nose for the time being. I just don't quite have um, a good timeline for when you could resume that. Uh, so let's assume you could open in July uh, and we're expecting infections to continue for quite some time after that, at what point does it logically make sense um, to discontinue doing that? Uh, and uh, you know, it, that's why I think there's a, a little bit of um, an issue with uh, like a hard line in the sand on that particular issue. Now, if it becomes really clear that, that there's no good reason to, or there's a very good reason not to, then once again, I'll, I'll, I'll join enthusiastically with the not doing that. Well, and, and keep in mind that it, like you said, it, you know, it doesn't have to be black and white or it's not black and white. And to kind of, to, to complement that, I think it doesn't have to be all or nothing and nothing has to be permanent. It would be okay to open our studios and say, we have a limited accessibility to our showrooms. We have limited staff. We are offering a limited amount of services during a limited amount of hours. And it's okay to say when uh, uh, certain parameters are met uh, and your area moves 
from phase one to phase two and kind of moves on as the curve is as flattened as they say or goes in decline, you reintroduce the more high risk piercings. It's okay to say we're going to open, but we're not doing nostrils. We're not doing anything in the mouth. And then as your area kind of situation improves geographically, then you reintroduce uh, those particular piercings, right? Like sooner or later, there's going to be a vaccine. Sooner or later, there's going to be improved treatments. Uh, and while that doesn't limit the, or, or mitigate the risk of getting sick, it does limit or mitigate the consequences. Um, sooner or later, we've got to go back to piercing nostrils. Um, so I think we should go ahead and move on to the next question here. We got a few of them. Um, PPE, the allowance of reusable versus disposable for face masks and on the client and or studio staff only. So I think that it's going to be pertinent for everybody involved in the studio to wear a face mask. Um, for clients, maybe it's suggesting that they come into the studio with their own. Um, again, pending availability for things, if it's something you can make available to them. Um, as far as reusable ones for, you know, um, for the studio staff, I think, again, you have to evaluate what you have available, what uh, you feel comfortable with, and what meets the standards for what you're doing. Um, so whether that's front of house uh, or doing procedures. Jeff or John? Uh, just the, uh, this is going to be one of those things very, very challenging yeah. to navigate because, uh, yeah, if you've got a, uh, specifically non-disposable, uh, or, or, or specifically disposable face mask that you're supposed to be changing in between each client and currently hospitals are unable to get their hands on those and they're reusing them for days at a time, uh, it's going to be quite some time before we have access to face masks that uh, meet that ASTM standard and we can uh, uh, change in between e each and every client. Um, so uh, I would feel really weird giving a, a, a strict protocol for that. I think everyone's gonna have to sort of figure out what's compliant with their local laws. Uh, what makes sense for the individual doing a certain job. And this is something that John could probably speak to better, but uh, when you assess the risk of certain jobs, uh, you assign PPE to those risks. Uh, it, so John, do you, do you well, mind handling from there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can only maybe really say very little about it, but I'll, I will say this, that uh, when products are manufactured and they go through the testing process for their use, uh, when, they, when they reach the end user, which is us in this example of PPE, um, any product that you use in your studio, antiseptic, disinfectants, and PPE, if you want them to perform as they're intended to perform, maximize their usefulness, you have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. If you have PPE that is intended to be single use and disposable, oh, hi guys, um, then, uh, then reusing it automatically makes it less effective. And the more you keep reusing it, the closer you get to zero effectiveness. Um, so, so we manufacturer's have guidelines. Sorry about that. We have um, a question in the Q&A about masks, so that way we can kind of address this since we're on the topic. What is your take on making disposable masks out of CSR wrap? I know they won't meet the ASTM standard, but would they offer some reduced risk? I believe some hospitals have been doing this. I'm gonna dish to Brian. <laughs> Please. Hi. So CSR wrap is not particularly breathable and uh, it is a pretty decent barrier, but it's only a barrier once it's been sterilized. Otherwise it's uh, semi-permeable. So that would be something that you would want to uh, avoid. Um, I don't think that's going to be a suitable thing. I, I think some of the blue wrap that they're using in hospitals for face masks uh, as a temporary measure, maybe the muslin wraps, but uh, those who are using CSR, um, again, maybe as a splash guard, but uh, I don't think it would be a, a practical solution for us. Um, 
Go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Um, I, I was just going to comment on what Brian, or ask Brian a question about what he said. Um, if I understood him correctly, he's saying that it, it wouldn't be an effective barrier, uh, splash guard notwithstanding, until it's sterilized. So is, is that a way of saying that if they were being sterilized, they would be better used? So essentially, um, CSR wrap, the fibers are not woven, and when they're sterilized, they tighten up. Uh, they could become a splash guard at that point, but then you lose the breathability. You, you end up with um, a, a mask that's basically like breathing into a piece of plastic. So that wouldn't be reasonable to, um, with a, the amount of humidity and condensation that would form underneath it for it to be comfortable. But it could be a, a barrier. So it could conceivably be used as a, uh, an additional layer uh, to prevent uh, splashes. We have... We have a, thank you, Brian. We have a couple of questions that touch on reusable cloth masks with replaceable filters. Um, one person asked, possibly one for each day, launder them weekly, swapping filters rather than disposable. I think one of the issues with that is that there is no data right uh, and we know that if you're wearing a mask especially if a fabric mask um, and you're introduced to it it's uh, um, it, the wicking action would be very hard uh, very dangerous for the person wearing it um, I think it's probably better than nothing uh, but uh, but not by much currently what I the most recent thing that I saw was five percent but I that wasn't with an, an inserted filter and I know people have been using like shop towels uh like the the car shop towels as inserted filters and stuff um the answer is uh no no one really knows because uh, there hasn't been a study on it and we won't know pro I don't think there'll be a, a reliable study on the effectiveness of that until long after this is over um, we have a question that touches on those cloth masks with reusable filters, uh, but it's talking about uh, washing and disinfecting these reusable masks at the evening, um, and then in the morning you have masks to give to clients. Um, rotated per client, new client, new mask. I think that if you're doing that for yourself and that's something you're comfortable doing, but I wouldn't suggest that for masks that you're providing to your client. Um, laundering them because you're kind of implying like it's effectivity by giving it to them or requiring them to use it in such a vulnerable spot. There's actually like a lot of rules about laundering medical devices too. I, I, I wouldn't, at least in the US, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, and then masks and beards, how do you, uh, how do those go together safely? John? Um, I can't say that they necessarily do unless you have a mask that is uh, intended to be a beard shield. You know, I suppose you can kind of tuck and rubber band certain things together and try and minimize the exposure. But uh, this is a scenario where I guess um, the beard holder would have to be creative in keeping that out of the way. Okay, and then I think that seems to be a lot of the mask ones that we have right now. Um, so there was another question that's not in the Q&A that was brought to us previously, appointment only versus walk-in. I think for many studios, it's going to have to be appointment. That's the, probably going to be the best way to limit the number of people in the lobby before they even get in there. Um, is maybe even the way I might picture it for my studio is the doors locked and there's a sign on the door that says, call this number to book an appointment. Um, that way we can ensure the flow of people. Now everybody's lobby is different, everybody's studio is different, but it seems as though um, doing primarily walk-in where people can just come in at their leisure may not be the best route. Yeah, I would uh, totally agree with that. I think to do any kind of distancing, you've got to eliminate that. Uh, and I think appointment only, at least initially, is the one of the smartest moves that you can make. Um, 
So should there be any screening type of questions? Example, do you believe you have been exposed or anyone in your home been exposed? Should we be asking all um, that at all? Um, we've talked about this a little bit in some forums. It's come up and, and between the group of us here. And I think that I think you should talk to your lawyer, your insurance company. Some insurance companies are suggesting that you put, you know, like a, a release about if you contract COVID in the studio, um, asking people about their health status, again, is something that you need to make sure that you're on legal grounds with how you ask and what you ask. Um, but I think that screening clients is something that we're recommending to keep them from coming into the studio in the first place. So asking certain questions. At the same time, again, we have to assume, we have to know that there's going to be risk because of asymptomatic carriers. Uh, and one of the things that I want to uh, point out that's kind of going crazy in the chat is that uh, in a lot of areas, locking the door won't be allowed for fire code issues. Um, uh, you may be in a situation that uh, locking the door uh, so that it's e you can leave from the inside of the, the panic bar style um, might be okay, uh, but you need to talk to your local uh, probably fire department or building code. Uh, yeah. to make sure that that's legal in your area. So just, uh, I think it's a good pushback on the, the locking the door. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say um, somewhat as an alternative, perhaps. Um, here where I live, I know of uh, two businesses that are keeping the door locked, but they have a employee at the door locking it and unlocking it as needed to let people in and out because they have maximum limits on the amount of customers they're allowing at any given time. And so there's literally a human wearing a mask standing at the door who's motioning to you, just wait a minute. And as they unlock the door to let one person out, they let you in. I think that, uh, again, it's going to come up to individual situations. It's going to be having uh, a dialogue with landlords, uh, health departments, the, the you know, fire code um, to ensure it might even look like some kind of like, um, you know, those line wrangling type blockades in front of the door. While it may not be locked, it is going to stop somebody from walking into a building if you have like a, a pole with a sign on it right there. Um, so it might, you know, it might come down to figuring out uh, an alternative that's gonna be safe for you. Um, we have uh, some other questions. I'm gonna see if there's anything similar to that. Um, so another question we have, would it be worth making a new waiver related directly to COVID-19, not make us liable for risks. So I think that that has been suggested to some people by their insurance companies. Um, I don't think that it's a bad idea, but it is good to check with a lawyer regarding any legal document, such as a release form. Okay. Um, Anyone got idea of legality of having staff sign a protocol, oh, it just moved, uh, on out of work behavior, specif uh, specifically continuing to practice social distancing, et cetera, and minimizing risk? I don't know, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, Okay. I don't know how how legally that could apply to our industry, but there is a precedent in that in uh, entertainment, for example. Um, there are clauses in a lot of uh, athlete uh, contracts on um, off the field behaviors, right? Um, people who get uh, product endorsements, like actors and, and other entertainers, and they can lose those endorsements based on their conduct and their personal life. So there is a precedent for for stuff like that, but it's not it. But it's because it damages the brand. Somebody's um, behaviors that get released into the media can be damaging to the image of the company that pays them to represent their products. In terms of like health risks i don't know if that would be applicable um 
Jeff, did you have something to say about that? Nope. Okay, uh, so moving on to another question we received beforehand. Can you address the shortage of PPE and increase in costs of PPE, cleaning supplies and toilet paper and how to offset those costs? So as studio owners, uh, Jeff and John, do you have things to add on to that about um, addressing these shortages or increases in costs? Um, I can only say what I said before is that I've already started restocking products that we had donated. Um, I, I can't do anything about the cost. I did pay more, significantly more for some of the products that I bought. Um, uh, but uh, I realized that raw materials cost more uh, and manufacturing costs more under circumstances like this, I suppose. So I accept that the price has gone up. But in, in order to be prepared to reopen, uh, I've already started replenishing what we've uh, given away. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how do you manage uh, an increase in jewelry prices, that sort of thing, it's, it's the same sort of thing. There's a lot of different ways to handle it. You can reduce costs. Um, I have a feeling that my costs are going to come down just because I'm uh, employing uh, fewer people at the same time, right? Uh, probably a good portion of my time I'll be working alone as opposed to uh, with an extensive counter staff, I, I would have one or two counter people at a time. Um, and uh, probably that will reduce pretty significantly. So even though uh, items cost more, um, I might have fewer people working. So I'm paying less in um, uh, payroll, um, which I would much rather, if, if I can find a way where I can keep the same payroll and just, uh, swallow the uh the the challenge of ex more expensive pp then that's what i'll do and then so we only have a few more minutes so i want to cover more questions here um so i am considering scanning clients before taking them back into my procedure room do you think that is excessive um, i have a son with asthma and i'm a sole caretaker of my elderly mother i think that that's something in the recommendations is that we're suggesting is uh is kind of screening people before they make it into the studio to limit um everybody's exposure before they come in um i'd like to say that if if you're doing that in your studio it should be documented that should be yeah. part of the part of the record keeping yeah the release form or record keeping with the studio is a good idea um, but the one part of that, just I, I know we're short on time, but uh, okay. the other thing is that I think considering uh, the increased risk uh, for the family situation that this individual was in, um, they may want to delay opening longer. Um, and that is one of those really hard uh, decisions that everyone's going to have to make because uh you're the sole caretaker for an older individual and now you're going to work a non-essential job that puts you in people's faces and breaking social distancing like that's that is a tough decision to make um, and that's why uh reserving judgment for people i think is important so we have five more questions uh, in the Q&A that I'd like to get through before we end things, uh, wrap things up here. So I'm worried about my state opening too soon. What should I do or say to my boss if they are a tattoo shop owner and disagree? Uh, you, you, you make your case. Uh, I think that's the best thing you can do. And also understand that, uh, if you dis you decide not to work, but your business is open, you may also lose your unemployment benefits depending on the country that you're in. Um, so, uh, it's going to be a challenging decision. The largest, yeah, I think, I think the greatest point you could make is that your state may not be meeting the federal guidelines. Um, the next question that we have, I'm sure this might get covered, but how do we reopen and maintain inventory levels if our jewelry manufacturers are in states with forced closures? Also have concerns regarding ordering supplies, mainly gloves, when they are hard to find right now and still needed for the medical industry. Yeah, the jewelry question is going to, it's going to go, uh, it's going to be tough. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, lean on the community. If you're out of something, there's a chance that somebody that's not even open might be able to supply it to you. Um, you might need to pay a little bit more for it, but th that could be a win for both people. 
It might, it might look like, cause I know there's a lot of forums on like Facebook, for instance, where people like the overstock forum, it might be interesting to see that like um, PPE or supplies needed in the studio are also being bartered by our community because there may be instances where somebody has a lot of something. We have like large sterile gloves, like a couple boxes of them, but nobody wears those. We had those for a guest artist, but if we needed some barbells, you know, we might be able to barter those kinds of things as a community. Um, so that would be interesting to see. Um, also, the, the, you know, the manufacturing facilities may be on a different timeline to open than the studios are. They, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those things where everybody might be affected uh, differently. Um, another question, numbers on positive testing and deaths seem to be readily available. Is there a good place to find hospitalization rates in my area? I would check your local government's website about that. And then when in doubt, I know Johns Hopkins has a good, uh, uh, good website about uh, stats and stuff. Uh, yeah, you're, so yeah, you're gonna have to look at your local state. Yeah, your, your local, if you're in the US, your local environmental health uh, agency, which is usually by county, We'll have that type of data. Um, was there another one? I think. Okay, it looks like we have no other questions in the Q and A at this time. Um, I just want to say uh, thanks, everyone, for making it to our rescheduled version. We weren't able to do this yesterday and uh, Brian and Becky get a giant hug from me because they were pulling their hair out like crazy trying to make it work yesterday. So uh, uh, challenging, uh, challenging day for those guys and uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being flexible with us. I think if anything, we are all learning to be more flexible as time goes on. Again, we hope to continue this discussion, um, continue evolving the recommendations as information becomes available, um, but we wanna get it out there and, and you know start that conversation. So thank you everybody for being here today. And if um, you like the information that we provided, please send it to your uh, state uh, departments of health yeah. and your local departments of health because those are getting uh, shared. Um, and if you have input, uh, email it to secretary at safepiercing.org. Uh, uh, the, the, the more people we have involved with this, the better. I'd also like to, uh, to end uh, by saying that um, for people who work in tattoo studios or if you have colleagues that our tattooers, uh, the Alliance of Professional Tattooers, uh, is going to be releasing their own uh, protocols uh, suggestion, uh, if not today, uh, tomorrow they expect. Yeah, this it's going to be, it's a conversation that's happening in a lot of places with health departments and health organizations um, and other nonprofits. Um, so we're going to start to see you know, the community continue to come together and share information. And I hope we can all, you know, be understanding of everybody's situation, be forgiving um, and be compassionate. Thanks everybody. Thank you.